to our business that is doing um, Internet of Things in practice, in real life, and um, solving a, a quite a fundamental challenge in South Africa and globally, but also in the same time, building a sustainable business at the same, at the same time. So as South Africans and any other um, colleagues from the rest of Africa, and in fact from any emerging market, will be familiar with areas such as these known as informal settlements or in other countries, slums. These areas are characterized by massive human and housing density, low incomes, and, 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 and little to no infrastructure. But from our perspective, these areas are characterized by enormous amounts of opportunity, untapped opportunity. So now these are images from all over the world. Um, informal settlements are not a South African um, um, occurrence. All parts of South, A South Asia, Southeast Asia, South America, and obviously the rest of Africa. And the, the number and scale and size of informal settlements outside of South Africa are much larger than the informal settlements we have in South Africa. Now, one of the significant challenges of, of um, informal settlements is this incidence and spread of fires. Fires um, rarely begin in one home and end in one home. They take out a number of homes, displacing hundreds or thousands or even 10,000s of people in a single blaze, as we saw in Hart Bay two weeks ago. And once again, the informal settlement fire challenge is not a South African challenge. It is a global one. So just some statistics. Um, according to the most recent census, it's actually gone up, but about 2.1 million, um, there are 2.1 million shacks in South Africa, which are home to about 8 to 10 million South Africans, which is a huge portion of our population. Um, in the decade of 2000 and 2010, a quarter of a million people were displaced when 70,000 shacks were destroyed. These numbers are slowly ticking up for the reason that we've heard in the previous speaker's presentation is that of urbanization rates. So uh, this is a natural phenomenon. People are coming into cities at larger and larger rates, seeking um, economic opportunities. And the only place that can grow in our cities, uh, in our metro specifically in South Africa, are the informal settlements. There's a um, fair amount of land available that does not require to be bought. And obviously, people need places to stay. So where we're seeing growth is in our informal spaces. And this is, once again, a global phenomenon. I'm trying to juxtapose this as a global thing and not a South African thing to give you an understanding of where our business is going. Um, about half of the world's population already lives in the cities. So just to give you a feel of numbers, in Central and South America, 128 million people live in informal settlements. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 166 million. And just South Asia is 262 million. But globally, 1 billion people will be considered living in, in, in these areas. And this is set to grow to 1.4 billion in the next three years now. So what is the challenge of informal settlement fire? So in a nutshell, cooking, lighting, and heating methods are of a high fire risk nature. Um, homes are made from highly flammable materials and built extremely close together. And finally, there are no access roads for any emergency services or first responders to attend to the fire in a reasonable time. So we see situations like we did in Hout Bay where 15,000 people are displaced in one day. So the beginning of Lumkani was um, a fire that began on New Year's Day of 2013 in Kailicha. Three separate fires displaced 5,000 people. And we thought as a team, uh, we weren't a team then, but we are a team now, that we had to deal with this and we had to use technology enable, to enable this. And there must have been a technical solution to deal with such a challenge. So we went through a number of iterations of design. And within seven months, we, we launched this product. And this product was launched in December 2014, so just over two years ago. This device is in about 7,000 households at the moment. Um, and now for our sins, we've, gone into, we've actually already been through a previous development cycle to now come up with version three of the device. And this is in about 3,000 homes. And we are already almost complete the development of version four, which is launching in three months. So it's a process of constant iteration. You learn from your client. Once you have 10,000 possible nodes of data collection, you are in a far better position to build a better piece of technology in every successive round and make it cheaper and make it easier to manufacture and get data from the customer to say, this works, this doesn't work, this needs to be more easier for me to change the battery, whatever the case may be. So version 4 will be louder, uh, have a much longer, uh, much longer battery life, 
will be far easier to install, will be easy to manufacture, etc. And no doubt we will make version 5 within seconds of that one being in the market, as is the nature. So what the technology is, it is an in-home heat detector. And this is very important. It's not a smoke detector that we would traditionally see in our informal homes, where spaces are larger and you don't expect to see smoke. So in an informal home where they are smaller and um, smoke is very prevalent from both inside and outside your household, smoke detection is ill-suited. It would constantly trigger, destroying trust in the product, batteries would be removed, and you've now lost all the fire protection that you thought you'd, you'd bought into. About 40% of fires that occur in the United States and the Western world, when they go and analyze the reason for why the smoke detectors didn't trigger, it's because the batteries were removed. And that's all because of nuisance alarms, and that's already in formal housing. So building a smoke detector would have been the, probably the most foolish thing we could have done, and installing smoke detectors in informal settlements is not a wise plan. So, in-home heat detector will alert you to fire in the event of danger. Within 20 seconds, that device will communicate using radio frequency to all the fire detectors within a 40 meter radius of itself, alerting the neighboring community. That's critically important because what we see is not one shack that displaces one family, we see one home where the fire begins displacing many, many families. So get, getting critical networked alert is fundamentally important to reduce the spread of the fire. Remember, we're not in the game of stopping shack fires. We believe that'll only take place once we have built homes, formal homes for everyone in the country. So shack fires will always be with us. We're in the game of mitigation. Then the data collection um, through, uh, through the internet, our, our, our gateway there is it's a concentrator which listens to our network of devices which is in GSM and GPS enabled. So in real time, we know exactly where fires break out, we know what time they break out, and we know exactly where to send people in the event of the fire. And we do two-way SMSs. So the moment that our system triggers, we're in, in immediate communication with the affected community, and we can get responses in real time of eyewitness fires from our communities and our clients. So I know this is a bit of too much info, but I'll get into a little bit more of the tech in a second. But our mission is very clear. We're in the game of mitigating the loss of life and property caused by informal settlement fires in South Africa and across the globe. So this is our back-end watchtower. Um, all of our data feeds into here. Um, let me go into a bit more detail. So this is Masi Pumelele. It is a very high fire risk community in Cape Town which will burn at least once a year and displace at least 500 people in a single incident. Um, where you see those blue flags is where we have installed Lumkani devices and we capture the geolocation of each one of our fire detectors using our, our in-house app. So we can track our customers, notify clients when batteries will be running low, notifying, notifying our clients obviously of where, when and where fires exist. And you'll see little orange beacons sticking out. So what orange, the orange beacons are smart devices. We put about one of these per 100 households, which gives us a reasonably good understanding of where the fire breaks out. In fact, it gives us a very good understanding of where the fire breaks out. 100 shacks is a very, very small piece of land, actually, given um, how, how small homes are. So what I've done in the screenshot is I've selected any of the blue flags. So I can go down to the client level data. So this data tells me the device barcode, GPS latitude, longitude, house number, customer first name, surname, cell number, date installed, who it was captured by, etc. cetera. Um, and then this is the kind of uh, strength of our mother devices, so the concentrator, if you will. What we can do with that device is we can monitor our system, which we are always doing in real time. Um, we can start the network, we can shut off the network, we can ring the alarms in Namibia in real time, um, and we can do silent system tests which I'll demonstrate in a second why that's important. But really, the reason for Lumkani's existence is about this page, and it's really bad quality. But since we launched in 2015, uh, end of 2014, we only actually have collected data of our impact since the beginning of 2016, so from 2016 up until today. To date, we've saved the, the, the socioeconomic challenge of Shack Fires, 26 million rand. 22 million rand of that is a ascribed to the savings to individual households living in informal settlements, and the other four million is to municipalities. These are very, very big underestimates, and we know that, but we have to start somewhere, and we have to start quantifying the value we're creating. If I can tell you that the technology we've deployed is worth less than 10% of that, I'd be lying. It is worth less than 10% of that, so I'll be telling the truth. So in effect, every rand we invest in our communities, we're generating between 10 and 17 rands worth of social value social impact, so it's a social return on investment. The one statistic there, the percentage of homes protected from the spread of fire is 90.76%. 
So we are radically reducing. We're actually dealing with the challenge that we, thank goodness, set out to do. We are reducing the, we are mitigating the loss of property caused by shack fires in South Africa. So this is Masi Pumelele. Um, I told you about in a few slides back. So in the top screenshot is the GPS, uh, the G, the, sorry, the satellite image, and the bottom one is the satellite image from our system. You can see that we're in about 18 to 1900 households there. We have almost 100% coverage. What that has translated to is, as I mentioned before, we have about two fires, two major fires in Masi every year. We've had one fire in Masi, and one home was burned. So year on year, we're seeing an almost bacterial decline of fires in our communities that we protect. Now, I have spoken about Imi too, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll reiterate. In 11th of March, I woke up to system triggers, and I'll go through that in a second. 2,500 homes burned, and they say approximately 11,000 people have been displaced. The city of Cape Town has said that this disaster has cost them 100 million rand and will continue to cost them way more. So, what I'm going to show you here, does this have a, power po uh, a laser beam? Yes, it does. Okay, so what you can see here is um, the fire was detected in Imu Zamuyetu B section at 1.47 a.m. Now, the fire actually began at midnight. So the fire was already raging an hour and three quarters before, we even, before our system touched it. The fire began around there and slowly burned its way through and touched our first household at 147. This says that at 148, about 50 seconds later, one of our clients responded, yes, there's been a fire. So that's the, that demonstrates the two-way communication. And where you see SMS, these are all the people that were SMS. We banged off 74 SMSs the moment our, um, the fire was detected. Now I'm going to show you the next slide. Um, now, we don't have full coverage in Masi. Uh, this is Imi Zamoyetu. We don't have full coverage there. That is as a result of budgetary constraints. The project had constraints. Now, had the, fire not, had the fire began in our community, we believe there would have been a very different story. But I want to show you the next slide. The top image is from Carte Blanche, uh, the Sunday after the fire. You'll see that all of this is completely burned. It jumped over O'R Tambo Road, which is about a four-meter wide road, and then burned another 500 houses here. The only piece remains is this slice here and this piece here. Now, it may be uncanny. You may not want to believe me. We still regularly um, check our assumptions and check our impact and ensure that we're doing the right thing. But this piece of slice corresponds exactly almost to the house of this slice. So we obviously speak to our clients. We say, what is the story? What is the deal? What was the impact? And the resounding impact uh, uh, narrative is that Critical early warning allowed orderly action, orderly removable of, removal of very important valuable household items, the collapsing of shacks to make a fire break to create this saved, this saved area. We did lose between 10 and 15 homes. It must be said that's the only way we even detected the fire in the first place. So that is just some interesting data to consider. Now, if I tell you that the amount of money invested in Imi Zamoyetu on just covering this section was about... 70 or 80,000 rand, and it cost the government 100 million rand just to do that, just, just, to, just to get the rest of the community back to a place of livableness. And mark my words, we are already building up to the next shack fire in Imizamo year two. So just to wrap up, because I know I'm probably running over time, um, what we've done is we've now launched a low-cost insurance product, a, a, a household product for low-income customers. Um, um, up to 40,000 rand cover. These are our agents. We now insure, since we launched the product in October 2016, we insure 3 million rands worth of household assets. We now know where fires are. We now know that we can mitigate fires. We now can build a risk model, and that's what we've done. Um, and this, this product continues to grow. So in a sense, um, we've turned a fire, the fire challenge, which is a horrible societal and completely avoidable challenge, into safety and security and financial inclusion. Um, thank you. I'm out of time. I actually did want to say one more thing. We are um, in the beginning processes of, of raising our Series A funding round. If anyone is interested in getting involved or having a discussion, please email me at david at or info at Thanks.